Good afternoon. Welcome to Hope Looks Up Bible Study on Tuesday, March 12th, 2024. The Hope Looks Up Ministries mission is to form a ministry geared to give hope, encourage, educate, uplift, and point people to Jesus Christ for life direction. My name is Chuck Eaton. I'm pleased to host the Hope Looks Up Bible Study. To accomplish our mission, we hold Bible studies both in person, as this one is, and also on YouTube. Complete study notes are available for each lesson. And if you need more information about our ministry, please go to hopelooksup.org, our website. Today, we continue with our 10-week study, breathlessly awaiting the soon return of Jesus. This is our ninth lesson, believe it or not. And the name of it is Elimination of Carnal Living. We're glad you joined us today. There are two parts to our meeting, teaching and prayer time. Prayer time follows teaching is optional for those who have prayer needs. If you have questions or a prayer request, please write them on the forms on the tables and uh, we'll pick those up after the teaching. But to get started, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, your word has so much for us to learn and apply to our lives. We appreciate Chaplain Haney for all he does to bring us these Bible study lessons, which help to prepare each one of us for the soon to return of Jesus. It is an encouragement to know what to expect as his return approaches, and to know he will protect his own. Bless Tom as he teaches today, and bless those who participate in person and on YouTube. Well, thank you, Chuck, and it's good to see each and every one of you, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to what we're going to do for our next series. Uh, our officers have a few thoughts, but if you have a thought that you would want to have, uh, let us know. I think we'll probably take two months and uh, come back uh, for our summer study, some parts of June, July, and August. So uh, you might give us an idea of something that you have an interest in uh, having a study about, and... Uh, We'd love to have your input as well. Thank you for joining us today. One great change that will occur when Jesus comes to the earth is a change in living a moral life and moving away from carnality. Now you might say, well, what kind of an impact or what kind of thought does that have to do with the Lord's second coming? Well, it has a lot to do with it because throughout the Bible, the end times, the times of tribulation or the uh, sometimes called the day of the Lord, talks about the falling away of the world from the Lord. And one of the things that I think I immediately think about is during the days of Noah, of course, there were only eight righteous people left that got on board the boat uh, out of uh, probably a, a, a tremendously large number of people. So it, it does make a big difference. It makes a big difference of what God does, how he reacts, and it makes a big difference as far as what God wants. God has never been thrilled with our uh, love of carnality. So that uh, shows many, many times in the Old Testament. One of the questions that many uh, ask has to do with the role of the United States in the end times. And some have felt that they found references to the United States, such as the reference in Isaiah about an eagle sweeping down through the land. But I want to just throw a little caveat in that and that is simply this uh, long before the eagle was a symbol of the United States it was a symbol of ancient Rome uh, and all the legions of the Roman soldiers marched with flags of eagles in front of them and Rome really did sweep the land and even held Judah and the Holy Land in captivity for centuries then destroyed Jerusalem destroyed the temple of the Jews and later banished all the Jews from living in the area of Israel, uh, Judah, Palestine. So we might ask, why would the United States not be a central figure in the end times then? One of the things that I wanted us to look at is the continued moral and spiritual de degeneration in the United States could cause us uh, to implode. Many statistics show that the trouble this country is in morally and spiritually. The latest research I read about a year ago said four out of five adults some 83% say they are concerned about the moral condition of our nation. If this country's moral fiber continues to erode, its demise is a matter of time. 
because of the high level of immorality in this country, God may bring judgment upon it. Christian leaders have been warning about this possibility for decades, but their warnings often fall on deaf ears, just as the prophets were often ignored during the Old Testament times. Because if people want to do things, they find ways in which it's okay to do it. Scripture reveals that God is absolutely sovereign. I put several scriptures down, and I wanted to quote one of these, and that is from Isaiah 46.10. God says, I have made known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand. I will do all that I please. God in his sovereignty blesses nations that submit to him and brings down nations that rebel against him. In the book of Job, we read, he makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away, Job 12, 23. Then Daniel 1 through 20 to 23 tells us that God removes kings and sets up kings. In view of such scriptural facts, is America ripe for judgment? Well, I have some cause for concern. As I said, God is absolutely sovereign over the nations. Both the Old Testament and New Testament often affirm that God is a God of judgment. America is in a free fall, plummeting morally and spiritually with no repentance in sight. We must therefore ask whether God might sovereignly judge America in the end times for turning away from him. I feel in reading the following scripture in the book of Romans chapter 1, you only have two choices left if you accept the Bible as valid scripture from God. One, you have to believe that the scripture somehow does not apply to what we do today or in the United States or to this era. It is for someone and some other people. Or you have to believe that we're moving towards the judgment of God. Paul begins his book of Romans by telling that everybody should be able to see the divinity of God in his order of creation and in his power. For the, and then he goes ahead and says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Well, ever since Hume in the 17th century, 18th century, we have spent a lot of time taking all the things that we felt were defenses of God's attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature, and finding human substitutes for all of them. Uh, whether you want to go as major as evolution, or you want to go as uh, minor as uh, just an order to things like the Ten Commandments, uh, we work really hard to just get all of that out of our system and not have it anywhere where we have to pay much attention. Skipping down in the Bible, it says, Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creation rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were concerned with passions for one another. They committed shameless acts with men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not seem fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So this passage tells us that when a nation continues to willfully reject God and his word, turning its back on its moral requirements, God eventually reveals his wrath towards that nation. God has a long track record of wrath against ungodly nations. And the passage reveals that one way God reveals his wrath is by allowing the people of that nation to experience the full brunt of the ravaging consequences of their sins. Many great nations have risen and fallen throughout human history. In most cases, the nation had no expectation of its impending demise. Indeed, those who lived in these nations probably believed that their nation would never fall. 
Anthropology tells us that many of the fallen civilizations in history also felt they were superior to their neighbors and to their ancestors, to their forebears. Interesting, isn't it? Few of their citizens could have imagined their society would suddenly collapse. But the harsh reality of documented history is that great nations do fall, and they fall hard. How about a small do dose of real history for a moment? The Babylonian Empire lasted less than one century. The Persian Empire, which sometimes is called the Assyrian Empire or the Medes and Persians Empire, capitulated after about two centuries. Greece waned in less than three. And the mighty Roman Empire held out for nine centuries. The citizens of these empires most likely felt their nation would last forever. But each empire suffered a gross moral decline and God rendered appropriate judgment. Here's a question I have often asked myself. If what we're witnessing in America today, being the pornography capital of the world, full of premarital sex, extramarital sex, widespread homosexuality, same-sex marriages, levels of abortion, addictions, easy divorce, the disintegration of the family unit, and the trafficking of children were to take place in ancient Babylon, would I think that Babylon was right for judgment? I think so. I probably would if I wouldn't attached to this nation feel that's true. The problem today is that many in our country have become desensitized to moral issues because immorality is so common. It's a dangerous position for the United States because God's patience will not last forever. I do believe that the moral condition combined with the removal of the church from the United States, the rapture, which I believe will happen before the tribulation, would leave this nation in a moral crisis that would be hard to recover from. The next time that God deals with carnality in the end times seems to be after the Antichrist has signed the covenant with Israel at the start of the tribulation, also called the Day of the Lord. The term Day of the Lord is used to speak about an event that will happen either soon or later in history, distant event, but in both cases it is characterized by God supernaturally intervening in order to bring judgment against sin in the world and especially carnality or idolatry. <coughs> the day of the Lord is a term that New Testament writers frequently use to speak of the judgment that will climax in the end time seven year tribulation period. Second Thessalonians 2.12 says, a number of spiritual passages indicate that this aspect of the day of the Lord has not taken place but awaits the end times. Isaiah 34, 1 through 8, for instance, describes the day of the Lord in which God will judge all nations of the earth. None of the past days of the Lord ever involved divine judgment of all the nations. It usually was specific nations or specific causes. I think you would be hard pressed to go back through history and to not believe that God did not intervene in World War I and World War II uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, it's just uh, hard to deal with the fact that he did not make some moves, supernatural moves, that eliminated despots and dictators, uh, fascist people from controlling the world. Not only in the Old Testament does the day of the Lord speak to the end of the tribulation, but also in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11 reveals that this prophesied day of the Lord is yet future. Paul warned that this day would bring sudden, inescapable destruction upon the unsaved of the world because the Antichrist signing of the covenant with Israel begins the tribulation period. We can also say that this signing of the covenant will start the day of the Lord, period. That will climax with unsaved nations judged, carnality stopped. Scripture also speaks of the moral signs that will emerge during the future tribulation period. But realize this is what it says in Timothy, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such people, I would say, 
Paul was saying here. He called it men, but avoid such people as this, he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. I just thought it was interesting as I was looking through the scripture. Notice in the last days, people will love self. We might call this humanism. For humanism, the exaltation of man, being able to solve all their problems, is really one effort to replace God. So many of our world leaders, many of our world uh, shakers and thinkers identify themselves as humanists, believing that mankind has the capacity and the power to solve all the problems. Lovers of money, we might call this materialism. And lovers of pleasure, we might call this hedonism. It is significant that humanism, materialism, and hedonism are three of the most prominent philosophies in our world today. And they complement each other. They go together well. If mankind can solve all of his problems, accumulate all the wealth that he possibly can, enjoy all the pleasure, carnal or otherwise, that he can, they just fit together. Jesus himself gave this warning. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. After Christ comes, there will be a judgment of the nations, Matthew 25. The nations are judged based on how they followed Jesus and obeyed his will, and helped out those people. Not used people, but helped needy people. That's the famous scripture about, Lord, when did we feed you? And when did we give you something to drink? And when did we visit you? And when did we see you in prison? And Jesus, is God, God's going to say, as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Well, things shift very drastically when Christ comes again. The day of the Lord has that judgment time has almost always reshaped nations, reshaped uh, areas, and it will again. The millennial kingdom led and ruled by Jesus Christ will be global in design. It will bring righteousness to all the world because Jesus Christ will be king over all of the earth through the millennial kingdom. Not just a section of the Middle East, not just a small country of Israel, but all the world. Some scriptures that verify this say, I bring near my righteousness, it is not far off, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Or again, my righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Or again in Isaiah, your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. The millennial kingdom will be a kingdom that is founded under Jesus, and so unlike democracy or dictatorships or socialism, it will be a theocratic kingdom. In other words, God will be the ruler, and it will all direct under him. Actually, Old Testament Israel was set up that way. Only the theocracy was God's word. And then those who served under, whether they were Pharisees or Sadducees later, early it was just the priests, carried out God's word, and therefore the Bible, the Old Testament, actually ran the country, ran the land. It will be holy, and that holiness will be manifested through Jesus the King and all of those who live in his kingdom. It will have no sin or moral violations in this kingdom. But, once again, it is that fabulous new heaven and new earth that we really see carnality eliminated. <clears throat> a great description I read of the new heaven and new earth is this. There shall be no more curse, perfect restoration. Curse of the, of the land, curse of Adam and Eve, you know, on the soil, upon the earth, upon mankind, upon a human, upon Satan. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Perfect administration. His servants will serve him perfect subordination. They will see his face, perfect transformation. And his name shall be on their foreheads, perfect identification. And all shall be righteous and pure, perfect behavior. And there shall be no night there, and there need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, 
perfect illumination, and they shall reign forever and ever, perfect exaltation. The way the Bible talks about this perfect place with perfect morals is simply this, in a quote from Revelation. It says, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It will be totally without anything carnal, anything immoral, anything sinful. Now, we've had some questions submitted uh, as the weeks have gone along. And most of my lessons have been long enough that I didn't think that you wanted to sit any longer to listen to questions, but today's was shorter. So I want to read you some of these questions and then give you a brief answer, okay? One question that came up early, when is the tribulation? We don't know when the tribulation is. We know the signs that will tell us the tribulation is occurring. The signs that will happen beforehand. We spent quite a bit of time talking about those. There will be a Psalm 83 war. There will be a time in which the Antichrist comes into power. Uh, we won't probably know at first. A lot of the world will not know that that is the Antichrist. But when he signs the agreement with Israel, and that allows the Temple Mound to once again be mount, be used by the Israeli uh, people, the tribulation will have started. Will Christians be here during the tribulation? Uh, I feel not. I feel that we will actually be spared that wrath. After all, the wrath is not directed towards Christians. The wrath is directed towards those who refused to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, including the Jewish nation. And so much of the wrath will come there and much of the evangelism uh, in the book of Revelation in the time of tribulation will, will happen among the Jews. Uh, in fact, it will be so much so that at the very end of time, when Christ steps back on the earth, according to Romans 11.25, all Israelis at that point alive will be saved. Another set of questions about the Antichrist. Is the Antichrist a free moral agent? Yes. The Antichrist is a free moral agent, just as Judas was a free moral agent, just as others who were betrayers are. And as such, does he have a choice whether he accepts the role? Uh, yes, but he will want to accept the role. He will want to be the most powerful person in the world. He will want the world to fall down and worship him. This is not something that anybody's going to ask him, uh, hey, do you, you think you might want to do this? He will be doing everything he can to cause that to happen. Does the Antichrist have a chosen mother like Mary was to Jesus? Only in the fact that God would have known who the mother is. No, no, no angel is going to come to the Antichrist's mom and say, blessed are you, you're going to be the birthing the uh, most horrible man who is ever born in all of humanity. Now, that, that is not going to happen. Might the Antichrist be controlled uh, created by the now artificial intelligence? I would say no. I would say the animated Antichrist in the temple will be controlled by AI. Uh, and if you don't think that's uh, very possible, then you haven't been to Disneyland. Uh, because there's all kinds of people in all kinds of buildings standing up and saying things, and none of them are alive. And they're moving, and they're dancing, and they're doing all sorts of things. Uh, so. Uh, we already have the animation that that would uh, happen with. Two other questions. One was, uh, do you believe that uh, there will be a third temple built during the tribulation? Yes, I do. And sacrifices will be all, all offered at that. One of the weeks this summer, maybe even two, we want to. I want to take some time, and this was a suggestion from Linda, but I want to take a little bit of time and talk about the Orthodox Jewish movement in Israel now that has created all these things to reestablish temple worship when and they get the opportunity to do so. I even have talked about some buildings across from the Temple Mount controlled under Israel. They have they have chosen a Sanhedrin. They have built the units that go into it. They have uh, researched the red heifer. Uh, in on and on and on. We'll we'll spend some time talking about that this summer. And the last one: Who are the two witnesses that uh, take? Uh, are in tribulation that are ended up uh, being killed on the streets of Jerusalem. You know, I sat in a lot of Bible studies, and every one of those Bible studies tried to tell us that it was a reincarnation of somebody from the Old Testament. 
And I want you to know, I don't find anywhere in the Bible that God uses reincarnation as his means of ministry. John was called a man like Elijah. He wasn't called Elijah. And so I believe that they will be two new men that God raises up who will be witnesses and who will be testifying for God and they will be chosen for that time and that season. Now they might have characteristics that will be like Paul or like Moses or like David. Uh, there are those who say, well, I, I think that it's because uh, two men were translated from this earth without dying, uh, and uh, Enoch and Elijah. Once again, if that was really true, why didn't John the Baptist? Why wasn't he Elijah? You know, he was called Elijah. That was going to be his role. But he was a, a new man born for that purpose. And I believe these two witnesses will be, will be the same. Now, lest you get kind of concerned about it, you'll get to see all those guys in heaven. <laughs> Every one of them I just mentioned are all going to be walking the streets of gold with you and I. And so we'll have a chance to, uh, to see them and talk about them. I have no idea if those beards will still be as long, uh, but I do know they'll be there with the Lord because Hebrews 11 says that. You know, lest you ever think that nobody's saved in the Old Testament because they were only Jews, you need to read Hebrews 11. It talks about all of these Old Testament saints who are in heaven. Uh, and uh, so having said all of that, I thank you for listening today, and let me turn it back over to our host, Chuck Eaton. Thank you again, Tom. Uh, lots of things to, to think about, and I know this lesson's been uh, enlightening for me, and I hope all of you. But in closing tonight, uh, we will be posting today's lesson on the Hope Looks Up YouTube site on Thursday, and the notes will be available on Sunday. With that, I'll turn the meeting over to Linda for prayer time. <laughs>